Hi, my name is Owen Moyet, and welcome back to Hebron Fellowship Baptist Church for our midweek worship. I have the joy of leading us again this week as we continue talking about the Old Testament. Last week, we talked about four things about Scripture. The inspiration of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, the authority of Scripture, and the sufficiency of Scripture. So this week, we're going to talk about the structure of the Old Testament. So before we begin, let us take a pause, go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll come back and start going over the structure of the Old Testament. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for life, health, strength, the opportunity you give us to come back and hear about your word. We pray, dear Lord, that we could learn something new, that it could help us understand what you're saying in your word, and ultimately how we could apply your message to our lives. So we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the structure of the Old Testament. So as we know, the Old Testament has 39 books. So to help us understand how this Bible is structured with these 39 books of the Old Testament, we're going to go over a numerical sequence. And this sequence is 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. I'll say it again. It's 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. If you add those numbers up, you will see you get 39. So these books of the Old Testament fit into these categories broken up into those divisions. So let's look at the first number. It's 5. So this first 5 represents the Pentateuch, which is the Greek term for five books. In Hebrew, it's also called the Torah, which we also call the Law. These first five books of the Pentateuch are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So this is where everything began. We see the creation of man in Genesis. We see man's sin and is kicked out the Garden of Eden. We actually see you know, about Noah and the flood, which then takes us into the creation of the nation of Israel, starting from the promise given to Abraham. And then we see that the Israelites are in Egypt, they are captive, and then we see their journey out of captivity in the wilderness and how they are marching towards the promised land. Those are the things uh, that are covered in these first five books at a high level. Then we go to the historical books. These are the next 12 books, and these begin with Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. So when we get to Joshua, this is where Joshua is now in command, and he's about to take them across the Jordan River into the Promised Land. After he leads them, we enter a period of judges where different people are leading the nation in different regions. And then we have the book of Ruth, which Ruth and Boaz continue the lineage towards the promised son, as David would come from that lineage of Ruth and Boaz, which will ultimately lead to the Messiah, or Jesus Christ. Then we go into Samuel and Kings and the Chronicles. So now the structure and the leadership of the nation of Israel has changed. They now have a monarchy where they have a king sitting on the throne leading them. And the first king, as we know, was Saul, then David, and then there's a the promise of a son that would come from the spring of Jesse that would stay on that throne. And that will ultimately be Jesus. And then we see the split of the kingdom between the northern kingdom, Israel, and the southern kingdom, uh, which is Judah. So those two kingdoms went different ways. And ultimately, we see where they go into captivity. The northern kingdom, Israel, went into Assyrian captivity. The southern kingdom, Judah, went into Babylonian captivity. So that's kind of the frame of what's happening in these historical books. Then we get into what we call the poetic books, or the books of poetry. These are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. In these books, they don't necessarily continue the historical narrative of the nation of Israel, but these are books that we turn to to understand the character of God, 
to gain wisdom, to gain knowledge, to gain understanding and how we deal with life issues and the things that could help us get through because of how common the words are. It's not poetic in the sense of what we understand as poetry with the rhyme and sequence, but they're poetic because of how they are written in the Hebrew literature in the form of what we call parallelisms, which is how the verb and word usage is, is between verses and between stanzas. So those are the poetic books. After that, we have the other number five, which are the major prophets. So the major prophets, and then we have the 12, which are the minor prophets. So what distinguishes the difference between the major prophets and the minor prophets? The only difference is the length of the message. It's not that the major prophet's message was more important than the minor prophets because the messages are from God and all his messages are equally important and they are all significant. What makes them major is the length of the message. So when we look at the five major prophets, the five major prophets of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel, we see that they are longer than the minor prophets. And these books are written during the pre-exile or the exile. They're written to the nations or to the people, telling them what's going to happen to the nation of Israel or to the people that are holding them in captive. And they even talk about one day returning to the land that God gave them. The 12 minor prophets are Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So these books as well give us messages from God. These things deal with how the day of the Lord is coming, how there's going to be salvation for the Gentiles, how to deal with injustice and how the destruction of Nineveh. These are all messages that also are important to understand God's word. So when we look at the entire structure of the Bible, we see how God is always moving and we even get to see his compassion and we see his judgment. But true it all, what God desires of us as we look at these books is to have a relationship with him. This will be a lasting relationship because even from the Garden of Eden, man was created and they had a relationship with him. After they sinned, he gave them a promise of what's going to come. He even that was to going to lead into another relationship with him as well. So when we have a relationship with God and we are obedient to his word, then we really understand and value the relationships we have with other people. And then ultimately, everything in the Old Testament points to that coming Savior, Jesus Christ. And because of Jesus we have salvation. So this was a top level overview of what's happening here in the Old Testament. We're going to dive a little deeper over the next few weeks, looking at each of these sections individually to gain a better understanding and more knowledge of what's actually taking place. So I hope you tune in next week as we talk about the Pentateuch. So until then, God bless and enjoy the rest of your week.